results in the U.S. and we have an affiliate organization here in Ottawa so we've been working together and dialoguing about political opportunities to really move the EFA agenda up in, in terms of government priority and to really um, shine a spotlight on it. It's actually a really interesting day because I feel like we've started at, at the very micro level, at the very local, and we have sort of pr progressively moved to, to look at national and the role of CEDA and, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about really at the, at the macro level. So what the international aid architecture currently looks like and then kind of how that is a container for really revitalizing country-led processes that actually put um, like implementing governments in the driver's seat and really provide a space for those local needs to be expressed and, and met um, so that they're effectively uh, implementing our, our aid and our aid flows and, and aid programs in a way that gets results on the ground. So um, the other nice thing is that we have already had a few others reference some of the um, elements of the international aid architecture, so I can breeze through the first slides rather rapidly. Um, this is just an overview of what the EFA Compact is, really starting in John 10, 1990, without much accomplishment until 2000, and then the Dakar Framework for Action, which is now sort of eight years on. Um, so th this framework is really what has provided the, the mutual promise to achieve education for all, to provide the kinds of resources both domestically and from, from external sources of financing to actually uh, scale up education and provide the opportunities for, for children with um, learning needs. Um, the six goals, of course, which you're all familiar with by, by now. Um, and of course, the scope of the problem, which there are multiple copies of the GMR outside, so I'm sure if you haven't read it yet, that, that you will, and, and you'll be very familiar with the, the range of issues we're facing and the kinds of numbers we're looking at when we, when we look at who is out of school, who has learning needs, and what's being done to really meet them. So financing education, and I, I wanted to say that we obviously um, are aware that financing is, is not the only issue, it's not just about more money. But we start there, and then we move on to how we can actually spend that money in a way that has uh, has results for the beneficiaries of aid, which really should be to the center. Um, the financing gap is between $11 billion, if you're looking at, at really just primary school, and up to $16 billion estimated by DFID. There are even efforts that, that uh, to do the costing, which, which are indicating that the cost to reach the hardest to reach kids, the most marginalized, the kids with the greatest needs, whether in terms of disability or geographic location, could be much higher than this. But currently, donors are actually only providing about four billion of that. So we're looking at a huge resource gap. And it's absolutely imperative if we're gonna reach any of these goals by 2015 or even beyond, that this, this mutual compact really provide the resources is met so that, that we can see progress. Um, so, I wanted to, to kind of raise the question, is the global compact failing? And what, we, what we've recently discovered in the Global Monitoring Report team just put out a press release that, that basically looks at the fact that there has been a sharp drop in aid to education. And that while there was a surge in financing for education after the Dakar Framework for Action was committed to, we're actually seeing since um, 2006 and 7 a huge drop of 22%. And that's really because there are very few donors providing a huge bulk of the, the, the external financing for education plans. And if one of those donors scales back, it has an incredible impact on the amount of financing flowing externally to support countries who have already committed a, a huge amount of their own domestic resources for their education systems. Um, so what we're looking at is really uh, a drop of about a billion dollars last year, but even worse than that, I mean, these are the latest figures we don't know yet for, for 2008. But as we're all aware, there, we are in the middle of, of an economic recession, a global financial crisis. And what this means for education is there, there is really a triple hit when it comes to kids and kids learning. Because essentially we have um, expenditure cuts and income levels falling. So both at the, the level of government with decreased fiscal revenues, they're gonna be cutting back on the kinds of social sector services like health and education. These are usually the first to be scaled back. But at the household level, families who are losing jobs, losing out on income, 
are going to have to scale back how much they're spending on um, items like school fees and uniforms and transport. And then for the, for the child themselves, they're more likely to be taken out of school so that they can help at the house, so that they can join the labor market, so that they can supplement the kind of income and resources that families have in order to get through a period of, of, of constrained uh, resources. So what we're looking at is a serious threat to education. There's been a, a large amount of progress made since 2000 with you know, increasing numbers of, of children completing school and learning and going on to secondary school. But we are actually at a critical point where not only have donors been scaling back on their aid, but now we have a fiscal crisis and that's hitting kids even harder. So what we have is, is a, a, a serious threat to the progress that's been made and actually we're, we're facing a possible reversal in progress. So, in the midst of all of this, um, Barack Obama, who's a, at, at the time a candidate for president, makes this bold commitment that the U.S. is going to contribute $2 million. Um, and that he's going to create a global education fund. And what he actually said was, at the Clinton Global Initiative, the third commitment I'll make is working to erase the global primary education gap by 2015. Every child, every boy and girl should have the ability to go to school. To ensure that our nation does its part to meet that goal, we need to establish a $2 billion global education fund. Now the big question in everyone's mind was, what does that mean? Um, and so in, in over the course of the year and through discussions that, that we've been having in the US with various political leaders, we um, sat down with Representative Nita Lowy and if you haven't heard of her, she is actually the person who basically controls the purse strings for foreign operations, for foreign assistance. So she has an incredible amount of influence, and she also happens to be a huge supporter of, of global education. And so I, I wanted to put this quote up here because just two months ago, she started to uh, engage the education community and start to ask questions and, and start a dialogue about what this new <coughs> architecture needs to look like and what it embodies. And so I'll just read this out because I think it indicates both the amount of opportunity but also the role that we now need to play to, to kind of answer these questions and respond to this call to action. So she um, said, President Obama's call for a global fund for education. For the next few years, under this leadership, the United States can demonstrate we'll stand behind our commitment to support a global effort to creatively and holistically provide the resources, expertise, and technical assistance to every girl and boy in a quality school. There are conversations in Washington and in other donor capitals about what the next step should be in the global effort to meet the education for all goals. Later this year, the evaluation of the World Bank's Fast Track Initiative will be released, offering the global community the opportunity to come together to develop a new way forward. Taking lessons from FTI and other global campaigns, the basic education community should establish its strategic plan for reaching the 2015 goals. Now I put this quote up here, not because uh, you know it's that illuminating, but it's actually incredibly important. Because for those of you who are not very familiar with USAID, with US bilateral assistance, it's typically not been as effective as it could be. The US has, has very much had a, a go it alone approach. Um, and a lot of USAID is projectized, so it's tends to be fragmented or at least outside of implementing country systems, which means that the U.S. has often gone in on their own and created programs that don't necessarily build country capacity and don't necessarily respond to needs at the country level. So the fact that we now have the ranking member of the Foreign Operations Committee on Appropriations saying the U.S. is, is discussing with other countries a multilateral effort for the U.S. to basically re-engage with other donor countries and with partner countries on the ground to improve the way that the U.S. is, is implementing its basic education strategy. So this is definitely a sea change in, in terms of U.S. policy, and it's a huge opportunity to actually improve U.S. bilateral assistance and make sure that it's more effective. Now, this is also significant because although the U.S. and its go-it-alone approach is, is you know, necessarily we need to be skeptical about the U.S. kind of railroading and deciding how uh, basic education or any development assistance should be done, actually. The, the fact of the matter is that the U.S. does control, or at least until this recession, about a third of the world's economy. 
And the fact of the matter is that the global financing gap is not going to be filled 